Thank you all for coming uh, to this. It's, this is a, a presentation part of the 75th anniversary of our diocese that we're celebrating this year. Um, blessed to have the diocese ask for uh, us to do a presentation on the, on the permanent diaconate. Uh, very blessed as well for Father Gartland uh, here at uh, uh, Holy Spirit Guys. He jumped right in and, and was more than willing to, to host us out here this evening. Um, and the staff helped as well to kind of get us going uh, with, with all the AV and, and all that. Um, if, we, if we could start this evening, uh, if you could join me in this opening prayer before we get started. In the name of the... Oh yeah, you guys can't see what's going on. That's fine. Yeah. Put a pan on the wall so they can see. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, help us to be better than we are now. Teach us to be more like you, and less like the world around us. Help us to put aside our selfish desires and vain ambition. Teach us to be true servants in both word and deed. Give us a servant's heart, just like Jesus. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So here's kind of the agenda we'll go through this evening. We'll do a little introductions. Um, then we'll, we'll, we'll do a, the history of the diaconate, both in the church and then in the diocese as well, to kind of tie in with, with our uh, anniversary uh, celebration this year. We'll talk about the vocation of a deacon, kind of the admission process and the criteria that we have here in the diocese uh, for men that are interested in, in pursuing the diaconate. We'll talk a little bit as well about the diaconate formation program that once admitted in, into formation. We'll, we'll kind of talk about how all that works and give, give a little insight into that. And then at the end, we're going to have a question and answer panel uh, with uh, Deacon Steve Seitz and myself and our wives. So we'll take questions um, and uh, expect it will be a fun time all around. So from so from an introduction standpoint, so I'm Deacon Chris Bach. Um, I was ordained last September, uh, September 15th, um, in, in, into the diaconate. Um, previously, I was at St. Maria Goretti Parish in Westfield, and upon my ordination was assigned to St. Louis de Montfort in Fishers. So, uh, so I got reassigned. Um, in addition to my parish assignment, I also have the diocesan assignment as a coordinator for the permanent diaconate program. Um, I'm married to Margie. We're coming up very quickly on year 25. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this summer. This summer will be, will be 25 years. Um, Margie's from a family charter members at St. Elizabeth Seton and uh, the Jacupco family. Uh, from, from Seton, we've actually got a nephew who's a seminarian, uh, uh, going through the seminary right now to be a priest. Uh, we have a daughter, Caitlin, <coughs> uh, she's a junior down at Rose Holman, she's uh, wrapping up her school year here for in, in the next couple, three weeks, and um, I think that's it. Margie, do you have anything else to say? Mar Margie is a school teacher. She teaches second grade. She's been, she's been, she's been counting the days. And she's been counting the days down. A lot of days. <laughs> Anything else? No, you do great. Okay, great. I'd like to introduce Steve or Deacon Steve Seitz, and have him kind of do a oh. kind of mirror and, and do a lot of <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I'll let you uh, handle okay. it, handle you and your and your lovely wife. Okay. Well, um, as Deacon Chris said, I'm Deacon Steve Seitz. Uh, I think everybody here probably knows that already. Um, my lovely wife, LaDonna, is with me tonight to encourage me and keep me from getting too nervous. Um, this will be okay. Uh, was, of course, ordained with Chris uh, last fall and, and Deacon Joe sitting here with us tonight. Um, so far, this has been a very interesting journey into, into learning to live this. And we'll talk more about that, I guess, when we get to questions and, and answers later. Um, so, my assignment, which really threw me uh, for a loop, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
so I am Associate Director of Formation for the Permanent Diaconate. So my role, after uh, Deacon Chris brings more men into the program, my role will be to assist in forming those men to be deacons in the future. So pretty daunting, but I'm getting better. It's, it's, it's okay. <laughs> uh, so LaDonna and I have two grown sons. Uh, one lives in Minneapolis. Uh, he works for a, a hearing aid company. He runs a, a research and development department there. And the other yeah, son is married in Fort Collins, Colorado. And yes, I've started complaining that we have no grandkids yet. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> but I'll leave that to them, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what else should I mention? Anything? Okay. You met with me. At, at same list of month. Yes, yes, thank you. That was the other thing. So, yes, uh, uh, LaDonna and I have been at, at the, the parish there at St. Louis Monk for 14 years, I think. And it was kind of a, uh, it, it was a blessing to get to stay there post-ordination. That's not always the case. And we can talk more about that later, too, as, as, as the presentation rolls along and questions when we get to that. Um, so it's just a real blessing for me uh, there. And it's, it's great to have Deacon Chris's help there. That's, that's been a, a huge help. As I've learned to live this life and, and to have somebody there, you know. And hopefully it's a companion too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been very nice. So, okay, great. As I mentioned, we do have Deacon um, uh, Premsky with us. Um, Ed, uh, Joe Premsky. Um, he's, he, and he's at the cathedral. Uh, in Lafayette, and then Deacon Bill Reed as well is with us tonight from St. Louis the Sea. So, thank you all. So the vocation of a deacon. We have these booklets. In fact, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and um, maybe if you could all at least make sure folks have these to refer to at their at their tables. So through, through the, the development of the um, diaconate formation here in the diocese, these booklets have been prepared. Deacon Bill had a big part in, in doing that, as, as well as uh, Deacon Miller. Um, basically, you know, a lot of the questions that have come up through the years get really get handled in these booklets. And so um, the presentation actually just kind of helps support this booklet. The vocations booklet. So feel free to kind of, if you want to thumb through it for additional detail, um, uh, just just kind of see what what, uh, uh, what what we're doing here. It's also available online on our diocesan website. Um, uh, so uh, you, you can access it there as well. So the, the so talking about the history of the diaconate. We can go to the book of Acts, chapter 6, where we read that the, the Greek widows were being overlooked. And, um, and so they identified seven good men, placed hands on them to basically assist the apostles in service. You know, and the... the, the uh, the, the neglected widows were the, the initial uh, reason for this. So they placed hands on these seven, and we look to this verse as being the establishment of the diaconate, of the servants to the apostles. And of course, our apostle today is Bishop Doherty. He, he is our successor to the apostles. So you know, it was from this beginning that, uh, that we kind of look to as far as the establishment of the diaconate. As the church grew from those early days, because in those early days we basically had the apostles and, and the servants, so really the bishops and the deacons. But as the church grew, the, the need for the priesthood, the presbyterate, uh, you know, became established and the priesthood started growing. Um, the deacons were really kind of the right-hand men of the bishops, um, and, and particularly from an administrative standpoint. They, they helped. They helped the bishops and such. But as the priesthood got rolling and, and, and greatly extend, expanded, there became a, a real need for priests. 
for men to, to, to be priests. And at that time, if you looked around, some of the best <clears throat> candidates for the priests were these were the deacons. And so it, it, it was, it seemed logical that the, that the deacons kind of felt that role. And, and what ended up happening was there were steps that were developed in the, in the, in the kind of the, the walk to priesthood. And it ended up that the deacon was kind of that step right before being a priest. And so what, what ended up happening was the, the permanency of the diaconate kind of fell away. And instead, the, the diaconate ended up being just kind of a step on the way to priesthood for those men that were headed to the priesthood. Um, this, this graphic here kind of shows the different steps. But, and, and even today, our transitional deacons are our seminarians that are headed to the priesthood. And, and a year prior to ordination, they will be ordained deacons. And then the year later, they will be ordained priests. So basically, a shift happened. And, and really, the permanent diaconate, you know, men that were called permanently to be deacons, um, kind of diminished. And it, it, we, we ended up basically with the transitional deacons kind of taking, taking that role uh, for service. At the Council of Trent in the 16th century, the reform of the diaconate came up. So here in the 1500s, it was like, we, 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 you know, this is something we may want to look at. The challenge of the, car, the Council of Trent was that um, they had their hands full with the Protestant Reformation that was going on. And so while the reform of the diaconate was kind of discussed, they kind of had their hands full in kind of working through this, the, the Protestant Reformation and responding and, 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 and even looking at and, and correcting some of those uh, challenges that, that were the root of the Protestant Reformation. But in the 15th, 1500s, there was some recognition there um, that perhaps the permanent diaconate ought to be uh, re-emphasized. If we roll forward to the 20th century in World War II, and of all places, Nazi concentration camp, Dachau, they had Catholic priests in the concentration camp that were housed together. Um, you know, and then they were able to celebrate the sacraments with themselves. But discussions started at that point about the diaconate. And it was almost a, a, um, a discussion about, you know, how did we get here? How did society get to where we are? And some of the thoughts were, would the diaconate be a way to, that might have avoided some of this? Clerical men that, that are clerics, but also are in the world, and might have been able to help respond to the, to the, to the abuses and, and everything that the, that the Nazis um, uh, perpetrated uh, in World War II. Those talks, in World War II, caught. And theologians picked up on those talks and continued those discussions about restoring the permanency of the diaconate and having men that were permanently ordained to service. Then the Second Vatican Council occurred in the 60s. And it was from those continuing discussions of the restoration of the diaconate that made its way into the, into the council to the point that St. Pope Paul VI reestablished the permanent diaconate in the Latin church. It's mentioned in one of the church documents that came out of Vatican II, Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution of the church. And it kind of goes goes into both the New Testament as well as those early church fathers, where they, they pull back, they pull out of this, the, the diaconate and the, and, the, and the permanency and restoring the, that, the order there. So coming out of the Second Vatican Council, the permanent diaconate was restored. Now that doesn't mean it happened. <laughs> 
in fact, you know, it, it was upon the the bishops and particularly the uh, the, the conference of bishops to, to to implement that. In fact, the United States Conference of Bishops petitioned and re received approval in 1968 in the United States to restore the permanent diaconate. So, so that was the very uh, the very beginning. And again, it wasn't a snap that it happened. In our own diocese, Bishop Higgy, he kind of took a, a measured, measured approach and said, look, I kind of want to see how this diaconate rolls out. In the early days, it was, in a lot of ways, those early adopters um, were, were kind of rolling their own programs. And there, there was some work done to, to, to establish some norms so that we had some national norms for the development of deacons. So that a deacon in Indiana and a deacon in Texas and a deacon in California, there was some con consistency there. So, but Bishop Higgy uh, kind of was watching this occur and um, wanted to kind of learn from that experience gained in other dioceses as, as they kind of uh, figured out how to do the permanent diaconate. He also understood that this, this national norm was being developed. Um, but our bishop has opened the permanent diaconate here in our diocese in 2001. So the, the, the first cohort, first class of, of men started in our diocese and they were ordained in 2005. Currently, well, through this process, sorry, 29 men have gone through the diaconate formation here in our diocese. We've got, had classes ordained in 2005, 2008, 13, and then our class in 2018. Um, in addition to those formed within our diocese, there have been um, other permanent deacons that have relocated into the diocese. And <coughs> and have faculties granted to them by the bishop to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to have ministry here in, in, our, in our diocese. Currently, there are 25 permanent deacons uh, in active ministry. And um, I'll put a plug. We, we've got a prayer card, prayer cards up here uh, that uh, we'd love for everyone to take tonight. Um, it's a prayer for deacons. And on the back, it lists all of our deacons. And um, on a daily basis, it'd be wonderful if we could solicit your prayers for, for, all, for all the deacons in our diocese. So yeah, we, we've got those up here. The ministries that are represented by these 25 deacons include what's listed here. Hospital, homebound, nursing home, and hospice. Prison ministry. Oh, hello, Father. Oh. <coughs> Welcome to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Do you need anything to drink? Are you warm? Fine. Are you, uh, we can turn down the heat or turn down the it's, heat. Got, no, we got water and stuff over here. Juice. Okay, you're comfortable. You don't need water. Okay. Thank you so much. And there's a microphone right behind you and it's almost ready to go. Okay. Touch Excellent. a button and it will. Yep. Come on. So you don't want any raspberry lemonade? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got it. <laughs> From the who don't know you. I'm Father Dan Garland. Okay? I'm the pastor here at Holy Spirit. I was 27 years in Lafayette. And um, then I came here, five, this is my fifth year. I'm ending up my fifth year. It's hard to believe. July the 1st starts year number six. And um, Holy Spirit's a great parish. We have about 10,000 registered active parishioners. Um, we sit on 57 acres. Most of it is woods. After your conference this evening, if you want to go over, there's a beautiful prayer path. Um, that will take you through the woods and you'll see probably deer and raccoons and possums and every once in a while a coyote. <laughs> <laughs> we have it all right here. Um, so but what, I'm actually going to be meeting with somebody who's had a couple issues. So the, welcome. I just wanted to introduce myself and Thank you. welcome you. Thank Here's you. Again. Thank you. <clears throat> we also will have a prison ministry, Latino ministry, marriage enrichment. Divorce ministry, help with the diocesan marriage tribunal, ecumenical outreach, campus ministry, and 
diaconate formation <laughs> and vocations. So what is the vocation of a deacon? Um, comes from Greek, diakoneia, for servant. Deacon is ordained to holy orders, the, the sacrament of holy orders, to share in the bishop's apostolic mission. Again, bishop is our apostle. So we share in his mission with the exception of the ministerial priesthood. That's, that's the priesthood. Um, but, we, but we share in his, in his mission. We assist the uh, bishop and priest of the diocese. As we mentioned, we're assigned to a parish as well as diocesan ministry. We make sacred and lifelong promises of obedience to respect and serve the bishop in the ministries that we are assigned by the bishop. We do support ourselves and our families while we offer about 10 to 12 hours a week uh, of service uh, in, in, our, in our ministries. We have a threefold ministry of charity, word, and liturgy. So the ministry of charity is, is really the primary uh, to the vocation of a deacon. It's to serve. And it's not only for us to serve ourselves, but it's to animate others to serve. And so, um, we, you know, providing corporal and spiritual works of mercy that are, that are listed there. Uh, care of the sick and dying, prison ministry, working with the poor, Hispanic ministry, pastoral counseling, and, and others as assigned by our, by our bishop. But again, this is kind of the primary. The primary part of being a deacon is, is, is to serve. The ministry of the word. Deacons are the, the ordinary minister that proclaims the gospel reading at mass. Um, we preach, teach, and witness the gospel. Uh, we, we preach at the discretion of our pastors. And we, and we strive to live out the gospel in, in, in church, work, and our family lives. And then ministry of liturgy. We assist the priest or bishop at Mass and at other liturgies. Um, and deacons may also preside at baptisms, weddings, funerals, communion services, benediction services, and blessings, um, all in the absence of a priest. If a priest is there, we would defer to the priest. Um, a couple things that aren't there would be celebration of the Eucharist, confession, and anointing the sick, and those are all reserved for the priesthood. So some differences between deacons compared to priests and, and laity. So priests, like uh, Father Dan, are ordained to the ministerial priesthood. They consecrate the Eucharist, absolve sins through confession, anoint the sick. Um, priests cannot be married prior to ordination in the Latin church, and they promise celibacy. And, uh, and priests are are provided with basic compensation, benefits, and room and board at, by the diocese for, for their ministry. <clears throat> Deacons are ordained as basically an icon of Christ the servant. We, have, we give full-time service in a secular setting uh, with our family, our home life, and our work life. We have the consent of our wives for <coughs> information and <coughs> ordination. They, they, are, they are in that with us. We, we provide all financial needs of our family. We, we receive no compensation. And some of our promises include praying the Liturgy of the Hours daily, ongoing uh, formation for ourselves, and we also make a, a promise to remain in the diocese for life uh, to, to the best of our ability. A, a work, you know, work, work relocation, things like that, like I mentioned earlier, might come into play. So deacon does, we, we make a total gift of service to the bishop. We receive no compensation. We provide for our own livelihood. And the challenge, as a new deacon that I'm finding, the challenge is balancing all these things. Church, spouse, children, work, myself. That, 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 that's been a, a, probably the, one of the biggest challenges uh, over, the, over the last what, seven months or so, seven, eight months. As far as men who are interested uh, in pursuing the diaconate, the call, the call to serving the church in holy orders must be affirmed through and in the church. The church helps with that. And the diaconate is actually a threefold uh, uh, discernment. The man, his wife, and the church to make sure 
all three are, are in, in alignment. We form men in five-year cohorts. It takes five years for, for our formation. First step is you contact the vocations coordinator, which would be me. We kind of have an intake form and survey. Um, based on that, we may extend a formal application. Um, that process can take several months to kind of work through a gathering paperwork and then filling things out. Uh, that, that's reviewed by a, a diocesan admissions committee. We may extend a panel interview for the applicant and their wife, um, at which point a decision on admission into that first year of formation will be made. So this is kind of the five-year formation path. Year, year one is just kind of an inquiry year, really <coughs> focusing on discernment and kind of making sure that, you know, it, it's easy to say, oh, I think I'm called. It's easy for me to say that. In fact, I, I said, you know, I think I'm called. Um, that first year is really focusing on discerning. It, is this your, you know, and it's the beginning of that discernment, are you called? Uh, and it brings the wife in, into the picture, uh, formally, uh, as well as the church. Year two is aspirancy. And then year, at, at the end of year two, you enter formal candidacy for your last three years of formation. But all through this process, discernment is going on. The current formation cohort that's being trained right now, they began inquiry this past fall. Um, Deacon Steve's been uh, working with them. Um, and so that, from a timeline perspective, that means our next group of men that we're going to form, which would be cohort six, are, will be targeted for inquiry in the fall of 2024. So we've got a little bit of time here um, uh, to, 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 to identify uh, new uh, uh, applicants. This is all in the book, um, and, uh, and I'll kind of, I'll, I'll hit it pretty quote, quick, um, being good saying the church, uh, residency of three years uh, within the diocese in, a, in, a, in your parish, um, be between 30 and 60 years old, ideally we, we'd like to see ordained by 60, um, uh, with, with, the, with good health, uh, physically and mentally, really looking for uh, you know, about 10 years uh, of ministry, uh, uh, financial stability. If single, a uh, man will promise lifelong celibacy after ordination. If married, uh, we'd be looking for seven years of a valid, a stable marriage. Uh, if there's a, if a prior marriage was involved, uh, that you possess a degree of nullity. And if there are dependent children or adults, uh, you have to demonstrate you know, an ability to kind of provide for their proper care while going through formation. And even and then after ordination, if, if, uh, if appropriate. Basically, commit to a minimum of 10 years post-ordination service, uh, average 10 to 12 hours a week on top of family, work, um, and other commitments. Through a formation, there will be weekly academic formation as well as field internships. There are monthly formation weekends that occur. Um, there's a yearly weekend retreat for both the husband and the wife, and the husband and wife uh, are required on the formation weekends as well. Uh, safe conduct protocol is definitely a must uh, in, in any of our work with minors. And we have psychological, marital, and other assessments that's part of the application process um, that, uh, that we, we ask the applicants to go through. And then um, you know, we're going to look at education, finances, legal background checks, and all that. Uh, and again, this is kind of all in the booklet. The five formation dimensions are kind of called out um, in those national norms. Uh, for, for uh, diaconic, human, spiritual, pastoral, intellectual, and diaconal. Human is basically de helping to develop and, and hone those interpersonal skills uh, that we would use in, in counseling and, and things such as that. Spiritual, you know, 
developing and implementing kind of that, that discernment and a spiritual life plan that, that begins in formation but, but goes throughout the rest uh, of our lives. Pastoral, develop those skills to identify and be able to provide those works of mercy. This is kind of where that yearly field internship comes into play. So each year during formation, you, you'll be assigned a field internship um, uh, to, uh, to kind of help hone those skills. That, that ends up being about two to three hours a week. It's part of that 10 to 12 um, that, that you kind of plan on. Intellectual. You'll, you'll get academic formation in, in more than 30 uh, the, theology-based courses that, that kind of help us to teach, preach, and counsel and gives us all that background. Classes are one evening a week for about 42 weeks of the year. And we kind of work our way through all those courses. And diaconal, uh, you know, traits and skills that are associated with diaconal service in the church. Some of that's liturgical training. Uh, to, to, to basically serve at the Mass um, and, and, and benediction services and things like that. Wise participation. Um, the life is key to the discernment <laughs> process as well as later support post-ordination. Um, the wife probably knows us the best. And um, it's very key that, that the wife is involved and in, 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 in all along the way. Um, the wives uh, attend the monthly formation weekends. Uh, they've got a little book reading that ends up happening. Uh, a little light reading each month. There's a, uh, both husbands and wives have a one page uh, discernment, um, kind of a reflection that we prepare every month. There's a one page uh, spiritual report that we all prepare to kind of show our spiritual lives. Um, the wives study the catechism of the Catholic Church throughout the, throughout the, uh, the five year period, actually four years. Um, the wives are exempted from any academic coursework and exams or papers. <laughs> like that, yeah. One question kind of comes up is discerning the call with dependent children. And one of the key here is there's, there's lots of factors you know, to, to, to kind of take into play. Um, and really, we would we recommend that you know, the discussion in these kind of situations with the formation team, and not necessarily just say, well, my kids are, I can't do this with my kids. Um, again, we talked about discernment being the man, the wife, and the church. But kind of working through a situation with dependent children, or even dependent, uh, uh, other dependent adults. Recognizing, you know, the primary focus is, is for all of us is, is to know, love, and serve God. And it's to set proper priorities and achieving balance and recognize that, um, you know, very young children may just mean a, a postponement, um, but, uh, but definitely uh, something to be worked through. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to have a deacon and wives Q&A panel. Um, I'll invite you up here. <coughs> and we just welcome your questions. Any, anything off the top of your head? <laughs> you know, I want to start a little bit. I, when I when Chris first told me he wanted to become a deacon in the parish, I was like, well, what's a deacon? And so we met with uh, Deacon Steve Miller and gave me the book to read, and I did. And uh, I was like, okay, he's called. Go for it. Um, then um, we met with Deacon Steve, and he talked with us a little bit about what's expected of me, of the wife. And I was like, I can do this. This is not going to be a problem. I support you. You go. Um, but once I got started, it was a little bit more work, um, a little bit more challenging, but it has been worth it 100%. I have great friends. Um, my spiritual life has gotten stronger. My marriage got stronger. Our daughter was 15 when we started, and she um, would. Um, she was 
young enough that she still had to go to a uh, friend's house for the weekend. We were gone for the um, weekend formation, um, weekend formation. <laughs> and uh, she, the first few times she would call me on Saturday night, so Saturday morning to Sunday night or Sunday afternoon, and she would call me Saturday night and crying and ask me to leave him up in Kokomo and to come home because she was didn't want to be with her the friends family um, so that was very hard for probably me three months um, but then after a while she would ask us well when's your weekend when you guys leave it <laughs> um, so you know once we got over that little hump she was a hundred percent for it um, she was never embarrassed to have um, a father who was in the formation becoming a deacon or a mom who was in his wife um, she was 100%. Sometimes she would say, you guys are in church all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, she was right. But we, we showed her a great <clears throat> example of what I feel like growing up that she needed. So there, that's my, my spiel. <laughs> if you have any questions, you can. The daughter of Deacon Steve, do you have anything? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well. <coughs> How long do we have here? <laughs> so, I, I would just say that, that that call, that, that uh, especially very initially, it, it, it's very subtle, or it, it was for me anyway, and I, I think hearing the other men in my court talk, it was, that was a fairly common experience. There was no big... Uh, flash of lightning and thou art called. <laughs> There's nothing, if only for that easy. Um, just very subtle and it just, it, it, it unfolded over a, a really a, a long period of time, but I, I found that the more that you listen to that call, and this is probably true in, in just living out our baptismal call um, for all of us, but the, the more that you listen and spend that time in prayer, that whatever that call is, whether it's to the diaconate or or whatever it may be, that it's it's going to become more clear and more clear and more clear. Um, it's not to say that it, it would necessarily be, remove any of the, the the fear of what happens if I really commit to this call, um, because we're human beings. There's always that. Um, <coughs> but just learning to listen and to trust. And again, I think that that's, whether it's to the, to the diaconate or, or to just anyone living out our life as a Christian, that, that's the same. Thanks. I wonder if maybe you said it's like 10 to 12 hours mm -hmm. a week, if maybe you could just kind of outline what that looks like, or is it is it different every week? <coughs> you know, maybe you're serving at one like one dedicated mass every week, every mass. I'm mm. just curious. So um, yeah, in, in my case, um, it's generally serving a mass over the weekend. Um, depending on our schedule, it's, it's daily masses, and we've, we've kind of. Uh, done some, some tweaking to our daily mass schedule, but you know, serving the mass, preaching the masses. Um, Deacon Steve and I, um, <coughs> basically one weekend a month, um, the Father, uh, Father Pat and Father um, Travis basically said, you guys just take the fourth weekend every month and preach all the masses. So uh, Deacon Steve and I just kind of split that up. So we, we've got that going on. Um, you know, I've been involved, gotten involved at, at St. Louis de Montfort, um, you know, with um, the Stephen Ministry, and so that's you know, uh, meetings with Stephen Ministry and such. Um, uh, I did some uh, extraordinary minister training uh, within the parish uh, to to uh, to prepare those uh, those folks for commissioning as extraordinary ministers. And uh, it, it, it's not through formation. Um, formation does a really good job fairly quickly of kind of modeling that 10 to 12 hours a week. 
which is it, which is actually fantastic. I mean, I think right fairly quickly you kind of get a, a good feel in the formation. You know, does ten to twelve hours fit with, with all with all our other responsibilities? The interesting thing that I've found, though, in, in formation, those ten to twelve hours are fairly structured. Yes. Because um, I mean, you, you know, one night a week is is, is a class. Uh, you've got a, an internship that's typically you know a certain block every week, um, and post ordination, some of that structure falls away, and so some weeks it's a heavy week. <coughs> with everything that's going on some weeks a little lighter as well and it's feels like you're kind of uh, uh, reacting a little more um, but uh, you know you know homily prep uh, that kind of thing um, comes into play um, now you want to talk sure you, you <laughs> kind of, I, I think it, it varies somewhat what those 10 to 12 hours look like varies some with with what your assignment is yeah. post ordination. Uh, mine, uh, and I, I really have to be uh, self-disciplined about this, which is a struggle for me. Uh, but it, it, I've got the blessing of most of my uh, 10 to 12 hours serving that assignment as, as associate director. I, I can actually do it at home, so that's really nice. Uh, we we can sit down, have some dinner, and. I literally, I tell her, bye, I'm going now. And I go back to the, the room where I, I kind of have my, my office. And I'll, I'll do what I need to do back there. And it's a whole variety of, of things I'm learning to do. And, uh, but it's very different for me. Uh, just in, in I can carry my assignment out for the most part at home in that regard. Then like Deacon Chris mentioned, there's homily prep, uh, time spent at the parish. Uh, was there, was it last weekend for baptisms? Mm -hmm. Baptism. And uh, so you, time to, to go back over to the parish for, for baptisms, which is, that's just a, a unbelievable. Uh, the first time that I said, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, just, it's just amazing. Uh, so it, it's very easy to fill the 10 to 12, and would probably be easy to to go over that, and then you get all out of balance because we we do still have our wives, our family life. The people that pay me, they, they expect some work too. <laughs> <laughs> so. I think a wife also helps with that. Mm. I mean, I know with him, if he is out of whack, if he is doing too much. Like this weekend, his job took way over, um, so you know I had to be there to to help him with that. I mean, not help him, but I mean just to kind of remind him, you know, that he's got to, you know also got church, and you have to get ready for this presentation, and you have to you know, and what I can do to help, and that's whether clean our guinea pig, which he usually does, or take <laughs> out the trash, or you know, there's some ways that I can support him. Obviously, I can't help him at work, and I can't help with his presentation, but I can help him with ways at home to take that pressure off. And that is a huge help. Mm -hmm. um, as I've been learning to, to do this uh, right and well, as, as, our, as our director of formation says so often, um, because he wants us to do this right and well, uh, I guess it was near Christmas and our son who lives in Minneapolis is going to be home one particular weekend. And he says, hey, um, Dad, we're going to be home that weekend. I would like to do this and this and this and this. Kevin, that sounds great. Yes, yeah, so we're, we're going to do that. And I'm glad that she overheard me. I said, um, honey, you're preaching all the masses that Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, change of plans. So, yes, the wives are definitely a tremendous help. Very good regulator. Yes. <laughs> It keeps an eye on the actually the same thing. It keeps an eye on the calendar. That helps. Yes. Caroline. As an observation, I was a director in uh, St. Peter's Parish in Laporte, Indiana, and the <coughs> diocese started deacons 
roughly around 1984-85. And our parish was one of the first. And I don't recall really having the opportunity to meet our direct or our deacon's wife. She never was brought out in much of anything, so I appreciate this diocese. I don't know if it started in the beginning, but it seems to be part of what's all going on in the de forming the deacons now. Because the first deacon we had, uh, he worked as a catechist with us, and I had to scold him a couple of times because my pastor didn't want to, and he made that part of my rule. And I didn't <laughs> like that idea. But uh, it was because he used a bad word. And I had to straighten him out with one of my students. And But the whole point was is that um, we were still struggling and learning where his abilities were and what our abilities were and where everything fit into place in 1985. When I moved down here, Frank Sobinski, who was the director and coordinator of the parish before he passed it on to me, uh, went back and finally, after many years, when everybody knew he should have been a deacon, but he kept avoiding it. But he wasn't listening to God, and he wasn't listening to any of his friends. <laughs> and he became a deacon. But his problem was the fact that now, he was always the person who was controlling everything as a director, and now he was a deacon who had to listen to his wife because that became more of an essential part of the deaconship and the Gary diocese. So to me, I enjoy seeing what I'm seeing going on in this diocese. I, I like the interconnection with the husband and the wife being part of it. And it's almost like bringing the family through the whole thing. Because even that first deacon that we had, 20 years later, his son became a deacon. So that was kind of cool. Yeah. So, uh, but do, is it the pa pastor or the bishop? I know the bishop always has the final word. But um, who makes the choice as to how many deacons you get to have per parish? <coughs> Because we're blessed with two, but I know Father Sam from uh, St. John, Indiana, has eight deacons. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I know he, he knows how to, he's an attorney, so he knows how to handle yeah. what he wants. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I know him real well, we used to do retreats together. But that's why I kind of wondered, like, you know, how, how many deacons, is there a set limit or is there a... A way that's <coughs> well, I, mean, I think ultimately it, it, it's the decision of, of the bishop and, and, and his vicars. Um, I think where our diocese is, you know, is right now, the, you know, 25 deacons, um, you count the number of you know, parishes in the diocese, and I think we're kind of still in a mode here of kind of want to, to put deacons out. And, and so I know part of formation, starting formation, you know, one of the things that we struggled with was a statement that was made first is that don't expect to go back to your home parish. Um, and which for us is like, oh, huh. <laughs> um, and we had, you know, we had a, a deacon at our, you know, at our parish and, and there were two of us in formation from the parish. So, I mean, we were like, well, I uh, suppose, you know, we, you know, and, and we kind of came to, to peace with that and, and actually had, had really enjoyed being asked to go somewhere else. Now, why did two of us get at St. Louis de Montfort? I mean, I, you know, again, I think, you know, ultimately that's the bishop's call, you know, kind of where, where to position, uh, position his servants. Um, but again, like I said, I think, you know, there's a, a dent, you know, from a vocations perspective, I think having men see deacons and experience deacons helps men to recognize, I might be called to this. And if you don't have deacons spread out so that, that they are visible and, and you say, well, he's, he, yeah, he's, kind of a, he's kind of a crazy guy like me. 
If, if that's, you know, so it makes sense to kind of spread those out. Um, but again, yeah, it, it'd be the deacon, I mean, the bishop. Yeah, I was just really curious. And stuff. Yeah. I just want to add that we, um, when we, we when we went through formation, we were also told we did not have to move because his job, mm, our job, key, both yeah. our jobs, um, are what keep us, you know, a lot. There, yeah, there is a commitment that you won't be asked to, to serve at a parish more than 30 minutes from your home. So yeah, again, we're, we're, we're keeping up our own livelihoods and things like that. So, um, um, and, you know, homes and things like that. So that, that was, um, you know, something that was you know, you know, part of the church's promise to us. Um, but it was like, but you may not be, you know, you may not be at your home parish. You know, you know, we, we may have a need for you elsewhere. So I was surprised to hear that <clears throat> deacons don't get to request like Arizona as a place to go to. <laughs> because I know my deacon that we had in the St. Peter's Parish, every Sunday that he performed, he also had an activity following in Vincennes, Indiana, where he golfed. And you could tell by the color of the pants he wore underneath his outfit. <laughs> so it's like if, if he knew that he could never retire someplace else, that that would be tough on him. <laughs> we, we are ordained and, and promise obedience to our bishop. Mm -hmm. So that never... Like I said, you know, in the case of like a job change <coughs> or a relocation, you know, you know, there, you know there's a way to be incarnated out of our diocese into a new diocese, but that's a process and such. So for the most part, um, yeah, we... To the extent that we would choose to do that, we've promised not to. Exactly right. So it wouldn't be like I would try to engineer a change to, you know... As a mom... Vegas or someplace else. Right. As a mom, it was hard because I know our daughter was going to move most likely somewhere for a job. And I always thought, well, I'd move near her and be the grandma nearby. And that's something that I have chose and promised not to do, which, again, was hard at first, yeah. but, you know, now it's, I mean, I'm, I'm fine. I'm going to resolve that issue. <laughs> Mary Lou. I can't hear everything, so you may have said this, so please bear with me. Um, and I did not get to go to the Christmas this year, and I wanted to take this question. Are our deacons uh, recommissioned every year? in their commitment to the bishop like the priests are? No. So you're not incorporated in that? In the Chrism Mass, yeah, it's just a, uh, the priestly um, promises. But, but deacons yeah, yeah, deacons, yeah, that, that's not a part of, the, of that right. No. Is, is there some, do we need to think about that? <laughs> I think there are some who are having that discussion, but it's not, I'm sorry, Mary Lou. There, there are some who are having that discussion, like just at that level. Is this something that we need to think about? Okay, uh, you can put my name attached to the question. <laughs> <laughs> if it makes a difference. I really feel like that's a missing thing. It's very important to, that recommitment, that is such a public thing. Mm -hmm. We go to support our priests, I try to go whenever I can. Okay. And I just think it's a very, renewing thing for our church. It's very um, yeah. and often, energizing. And often times you guys are there anyway. Right. Yeah. And the uh, diocese is there to witness it, so mm -hmm. why not bring it in? Yeah. Well, and I think right now that, that uh, liturgy for that particular mass has that incorporated into it for yeah. the priest. It's not there for the deacons, so uh, to insert something like that in, into the liturgy uh, that, that wouldn't be something that would be taken lightly. Mm -hmm. uh, just that wouldn't it be nice if, you know. Uh, I hope they keep looking at it. Mm -hmm. Just just to put a little different spin on that. Okay. We make promises at ordination, mm -hmm. and those promises are lifelong promises. So there really isn't, from that standpoint, a need to renew them. They're already there for yeah. life. It's it's like uh, marriage vows. Sometimes people will repeat their marriage vows, but there's no need to because those vows are made right. for life at the beginning. So it isn't like there's a functional need to do this, but you are absolutely right. The impact on the church to hear and see the priests 
renew their promises renewing. of being. Mm -hmm. It's very renewing for the church, for the whole church, not just for them. That's right. And we can go and support our priests. Absolutely. And I teach it to the kids to pray during that week for them. So we kind of yep. need to keep in sync with each other. Holy Week is one of those weeks where we're not limited to the 10 to 12 hours. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite a week, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. What has been your been your most rewarding experience? What's been, been maybe a challenge for you? I guess for me, there's been there's been many rewarding experiences of <coughs> Like Deacon Steve said, a, a baptism is incredible. Um, and I, I, I think I even went into my first baptism not really expecting that. Um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a part of, you know, here, here's the right to, to do baptism, but, um, um, and I, you know, I, I haven't done very many, maybe seven or eight at this point. Um, but they're just fantastic. Um, and that was a real surprise. The other thing to me that, um, that, again, was a surprise is, you know, serving Mass, sitting in the sanctuary, and looking out at the, at, at the Church of Christ, and seeing the diversity. Um, and it's like, very all, all film, um, and and I love the training for um, extraordinary ministers, um, and to impress upon them, you know, that particular ministry is incredible. It's it's one of the most tangible ways that you are sharing Jesus Christ with others, and you know, and. and and, and even when you know, as an ordinary minister of, of uh, communion, as a, as a deacon, uh, as opposed to an extraordinary, we, we are ordinary ministers, so we, so, you know, we, we offer communion. At times, if I get caught up in that, it's, it's, it's it can make me choke up. Um, you know, particularly if, you know, I, I the, the I've had situations where you know a uh, an usher will will take me back to someone who, who wasn't able to come up for communion, and and, and it's a, sometimes I I struggled with getting the words out of my mouth, that, that, you know of, of giving communion uh, to, to to someone. So I think uh, th those have been pretty all, all inspiring for me. No, I, I think for, for myself, since I've had a couple minutes to sit here and think about it, which Deacon Chris did not so much. Um, not that that wasn't, I mean, I, I fully agree with what you said, but I have the luxury of a few extra minutes. Uh, the single most rewarding thing for me so far, uh, early in, in formation, my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. She knew that I'd entered formation and she was very happy about it and for the first couple of years uh, would, would ask about it and was just very excited about it. Well then as that disease progresses and it takes the person away more and more, um, she was, she kind of lost that recognition that anything was going on. And then uh, in the end she was not able to attend um, the ordination and then even passed away just a couple of months later in, in November. Uh, they live in the Diocese of Evansville and the pastor of the parish where I grew up and where my mom and dad were married where we were married that's where our children our whole spiritual life started in this little parish this pastor welcomed me to assist at my mom's funeral and that is the single most rewarding thing so far to me, just because I know how pleased she was at that. And uh, that it was just, it was just a, a, an amazing experience. Um, it, I, 
I will just leave it at that, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and then one other, just on a more practical, just any given weekend at, at Mass for me, uh, the baptisms are awesome. Uh, it's just, it's still just incredible. Uh, but I found, much to my surprise, and Deacon Joe and Deacon Chris, they, we, we heard each other preaching in formation. And sometimes it's pretty good, sometimes it's <laughs> <laughs> But I, I'm really appreciating that role. In, in, and we're blessed to get to preach as much as, as we do. It, it's a tremendous blessing. And when I know that I've, I've prayed well, prepared well, and I'm doing it well, I can see everybody engaged. I, I got everybody here. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just a tremendous uh, realization that, that maybe I have discerned this well and he's using me right now, you know? And then that's, it does, it just sometimes just almost chokes you up. There. Was there a, a least in that? Oh, oh, challenge. Channel, your cha biggest yeah. challenge or frustration? Did <laughs> 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 you do that part already? I didn't do that part. So challenge, I think, um, I, don't know that, I don't know that I would say frustration. I, I think the challenge was balance. Yes, that's the first thing you came about. Yeah, it, it's... It's balance, and again, Margie's very helpful in, in, in kind of helping be that pressure regulator. Um, and I, again, I guess I, I, without going in a lot, re reiterating it again, but I mean, going from a very structured formation environment to, um, you know, unstructured. Um, it, it, it's, that's, that's kind of been my, my big challenge. But, you know, good Lord. He gets you through. He, he gets us through. And those things get done somehow. Yep, yep absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes you look back and say, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know how it happened. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Lou? Yeah, I think that's it. This is part of being a child in the 60s, but we're all almost dead. So I need you all my questions and <laughs> um, I don't know if the, this question will be addressed in Rome or diocese by diocese. Mm -hmm. I suspect it will have to be Rome. Is there any discussion and serious thought being given to giving deacons uh, the sacramental right to forgive sin? Not to my knowledge. No, I mean, I, I think uh, that's, yeah. the, I mean, the, I mean you know, that, that's reserved to the, to the priesthood. And, and it, you know, that, that's a faculty that's, um, that's given to the priesthood upon uh, their ordination. <coughs> I know. Yeah. But, well, as a catechist, I've spent 55 years preparing people for confession. Mm -hmm. And every so often, someone says, could you just forgive me and give me absolution? <laughs> <laughs> or one of the little kids will say, but Mrs. Fisher, I thought you were a priest. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what's going through their minds. Right. Right. And then I hear that we have this um, operating principle in church that practice precedes a change. Is that part of our tradition? That, that the change happens gradually, one to one, or out with the people, and then it becomes our policy? Do you hear any discussion like that? That almost feels like it's a six six question. the law of gradualism. Um, I would say that they're putting it into the time frame that you're speaking. Um, 
you know, coming out of Vatican II and such. Right. Um, your question is, do, does change go from the bottom up, or come from the top down? Um, and I would say that the top gives us the, the, uh, the rules and the guidelines, and at the point, you know, and there are some things that are, are negotiable and, 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 and changeable or can mold. There's things that aren't. And, um, but I would say, and this is my personal opinion, I'll declare it as personal opinion, um, as far as, you know, um, someone deciding, hey, we're, we're, we're going to do mass different here. Uh, as soon as they go outside that that norm, they're they're they are, they're out of bounds, and it, it's not a matter of if we get five guys to go out of bounds that we that we make the change. Thank you. It's part of obedience. I mean, it, the obedience of the priesthood, the obedience of the diaconate. Right. Obedience is hard. <laughs> <laughs> the young man who was uh, my director up north before he handed it over to me, I thought was rather naive because he was much younger than me. And he said he tried to get his wife to go with him at the same time for confession. I'm sure as a deacon now he would not invite her to come in and be part of his confession. <laughs> but um, that it has changed enough to where I suppose it could happen, but I just don't see that. Any other questions? Deacon Steve, do you have an area of concentration, like Deacon Chris mentioned, he got involved in Stephen ministry. I don't know if that was by purpose or Voluntold by the pastor. <laughs> uh, no, in, in fact, um, I, my role at the parish is, is pretty much to assist at mass, uh, preach on occasion, and assist with baptisms. Uh, I don't have any other parish responsibilities than that, and that's the, the reason for that is because of the time commitment required in my role as associate director uh, for formation which is the reason we have two deacons in our parish, because uh, with the size of the parish and uh, knowing that the Father Pat was very supportive of the permanent diaconate, I, I think the decision to, to put Deacon Chris there to, to carry some of that weight with, with Stephen ministry and maybe with, I'm not sure if there are any others that you're doing yet, uh, <laughs> uh, just so that there would be a deacon available for that, but I, I don't have it. Mine is, is about 98% in my other assignment. And I will be assisting him starting the summer at the student ministry. So I had to get through school, and then I will the summer will have time to get home into it. Did that, well, is that the question you were asking, Mike? Further questions? Um, Can you tell them that's been a while? Pardon me? Look at the book. Oh, the book, yeah, the booklet's going to have my contact information in them. Uh, it's on the website as well. Like I said, we have prayer cards up here that we would love for everyone to take. There's some brochures here as well about the permanent diaconate that you're, you're welcome to, uh, to take as well. Um, We'd also welcome you to, to sign in up here so we have kind of a record of, uh, of, of who attended. 
um, this, this evening. And with that, I think um, if, we, if I could just end this with a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good and gracious Father, we thank you for this day, for giving, giving us this beautiful day. We ask you to continue to watch over all of us, to guide us in, in each of our vocations, um, and uh, particularly for those that might be interested and, and called to the permanent diaconate, help, help, help guide them and help us to, uh, to help them in, in their discernment uh, to this vocation. And we pray all this through Christ our Lord, Amen. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Amen.